Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Cisco's Men's Health Forum. My name is Bill Updike. I'm a doctor of chiropractic practicing in Building Q, just down the street at Life Connections in San Jose here. I've been here since we opened the building about 10 years ago. And today we're here to talk about your health, how to enable you to be your best and bring your best every day for your family and for Cisco. We have an executive sponsor for this event and actually for Life Connections in general. And uh, uh, G. Rittenhouse, Senior Vice President, he couldn't be with us today, but we have a video that we're gonna run that uh, should start shortly. It's that time of year again when we tell ourselves we're gonna lose those extra 10 pounds, exercise a bit more and eat better. We start with the best intentions, but by February or March, reality creeps in and we're back into the same old routine. Our goal with today's Men's Health Forum is to provide the knowledge and support you need to change it up in 2019 and produce a different outcome this time around. My name is G. Rittenhouse. I'm the Senior Vice President and General Manager of the Security Business Group and also the Executive Sponsor for Life Connections. I want to emphasize that while today's forum is focused on men's health, it's open to all employees, men and women alike. Regardless of who you are, you're likely to have men in your lives, brothers, fathers, spouses, and by attending this event, you can help them improve their habits and maintain good health throughout this year and beyond. Working in the tech industry, we have become acclimated to intense deadlines, long hours, stress, and sitting through endless meetings. It's probably obvious, but this doesn't lead to a healthy lifestyle or enable you to reach your personal or professional goals. It's also not a great idea to overcompensate for this by cranking it up on the weekends trying to make up for lost time. Cisco is dedicated to simplifying your access to quality health care and providing the knowledge you need to minimize stress and prevent illness or injuries. Over the next few hours, you'll hear from medical professionals about the importance of a healthy lifestyle and how we can best achieve and maintain it. Take advantage of the Q&A portion of the event. And if you haven't done so, learn how to best leverage the services of Life Connections available to you. From nutrition, gym and exercise classes, physical therapy, chiropractic, medical, vision, dentistry, all coupled together for easy access and convenient hours. My hope is that you'll take full advantage of this event, not only to learn from the experts, but also to help set reasonable goals, track progress, and feel back on your feet if you're injured or sick. Together, we'll make 2019 a more healthy and productive year, and finally break the usual failed New Year's resolution cycle. Thanks for your time and enjoy the Health Forum. All right, well, thank you, G. So first things first, social media, we can't pass that up. If you're going to talk to the world through social media, please use the appropriate hashtags for crying out loud. Men's health, love where you work, and we are Cisco, or else apparently it doesn't, social media doesn't work. So a little story about what we're going to be going through today. We're, uh, we're going to have a journey that's going to talk about movement. And movement actually has a lot to do with health. Obviously, if we're not moving, what's happening? We're not alive. Um, there's a direct correlation there. So we're going to start our talk off with um, a little bit about why we want to move. Then we're going to get into um, how to move, how to move more. We're going to talk about when, um, you, when you move and you have pain or it hurts and how to approach that. And then finally, we're going to end up with if you can't move. Um, how that looks and what happens. So before we get into that, I want to touch on something that uh, all the researchers in the world have told us about all of you here in San Jose and at RTP and everybody else that sits and works in front of a computer and sits at a desk all day long. You know, the number one problem that you guys and all of us end up with are musculoskeletal problems, which means muscles and joints and bones and nerves and all that stuff. And the most common area that we end up with problems are actually our lower back. That's the number one thing that we see over in Building Q and at RTP. And it's also, um, you know, across the United States, an epidemic of, of a problem. The second problem, most frequent problem, is neck pain. 
We also have a lot of shoulder problems. We also have a lot of knee problems. But spine problems are actually really the number one thing that we see and that you guys um, are prone to. So we're going to work on trying to help you to not actually have that type of a problem. And when I, when I think about spine problems being so prevalent, I think of two things. I think, thank God I picked a great profession because I got plenty of work and I don't have to worry about not having a job. But what I really think about, about that, because you know, when you look at the term doctor, doctor means teacher. And teacher means that it is our job as healthcare providers to teach you how not to have to see us, how to maintain your health, and how to stay healthy. And that's what today is all about. So um, to get the ball rolling here, we're lucky to have Dr. Larry Kwan. He's going to lead things off for us. Um, Dr. Kwan is our medical director over at uh, Life Connections Health Center. Um, and he's also a, an assistant um, uh, clinical professor. And um, today he's going to be talking to us about why we want to move. <clears throat> Thanks, Bill. Um, so yeah, so I'm Larry Kwan. Uh, I've had the pleasure of uh, taking care of uh, Cisco employees for the last uh, four years at uh, Building Q as part of a Stanford School of Medicine faculty. Uh, I'm part of a team of primary care physicians based. Uh, how many people have been to Building Q, just so I know? So you guys know Building Q, right? So Building Q, you have primary care doctors, chiropractors, and we're all there trying to take care of your health. And somebody asked me, why is Stanford in Building Q? Um, turns out, uh, you guys don't actually like to go see doctors. <laughs> you really don't. Uh, and turns out, from a primary care perspective, if I try to get closer to you, you're more likely to come see me, and I can actually take care of you better. And so from a primary care physician perspective, it allows Stanford to be in places to better care for populations. And so there was some great alignment there, and so that's kind of why we're there. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit broadly at first. How many people here have heard of blue zones? Raise your hand, blue zones. No, oh, all right. How many people here know what centenarian means? Yeah, what's a centenarian? That's right. It's somebody who's over 100 years old. All right. So these blue zones are places around the world with the mo highest prevalence of people who live over 100. It was uh, published in National Geographic in 2005 by a guy named Dan Butner off of some research that was done. They started in uh, Sardinia, Italy. And they found, ultimately, five places where you have people who live 100 years or more, all right? The question then becomes, how did they do that, right? What were common habits amongst those five places that allowed them to do that, OK? So what they found were nine habits that seem common in those blue zones. Okay? You can see them up on the list. We're not going to go through all of them. but. Notice that the first one is move naturally. Everybody in the blue zones turns out move. They uh, garden. They walk to their work in Sardinia. Many of them were shepherds. They all moved, common. And it didn't necessarily have to be in a gym. They walk to work, all those things. Sense of purpose. They wake up in the morning and kind of have a sense of why they're doing things, sense of joy in what they do. Downshift, they had a cadence of life that wasn't always in a hurry. One of my favorite writers, Dallas Willard, writes about this society having hurry sickness. Everything has to be done in a hurry. 80% rule, any thoughts on what 80% rule might be? 80% rule? It's an eating rule. Most of the blue zones, they don't eat till they're full. They eat till about 80%. Very counterculture for this. <laughs> plant slant, they allow plants. Uh, favorite for, this, for the group, wine at five. A lot of the places, most of the places had some sort of tradition around wine at five. Here in the US, we tend to pick the habits we like and say, well, OK, I guess if I have wine, <laughs> I'll live to 100. One of the points about this is that there were nine comprehensive habits. You just can't pick the one you want. 
And the last three are striking to me. They felt like they belonged someplace. They put their loved ones first. And they had a tribe. What does that mean, tribe? Huh? Genes. What was that? Genes. Something to do with genes. Something to do with genes. No, no, no. Community. They had a community. They had a group of people that had similar values that they hung out with. Now, if you look at this list, purpose, downshift, belong, loved ones, right tribe, none of that has to do with diet and exercise. They have to do with community and how you're connected to the people around you. And so before we dive into what this theme of this group is, is about is move naturally, I just wanted to give an overview of how holistic health needs to be understood. It's not just one thing. The tendency for uh, our society is to deconstruct things into the one thing we need to do to live to 100. It's not. It's many things. And what we'd like to do today is focus on one of them. And that's the move naturally. What does that mean? So the next slide uh, speaks to the question of why don't we move, right? Why don't we move? We all know we're supposed to exercise. Uh, G kind of talked about it. We're all signed up for our gyms. We're going to go and start to do all these things. By March, we're going to not be doing those things. Why do we not move? So I'll tell you a joke. There are two fish, right? Two fish. Uh, swimming around, two young fish, an old fish swims by them. The old fish looks at the two young fish and goes, hey, how's the water, kids? And then swims along. Two young fish look at each other and go, what's water? All right? What's water? Why wouldn't the young fish know what they're swimming in? They don't know what they're immersed in. We are immersed in an environment that kind of causes us potentially to not move. This is how we used to clean rugs. Anybody ever done this before? Yeah, yeah, you take a rug outside and you beat it, right? Get all the dust out. It takes about 200 calories to, uh, to do this. So you do this once a week, you spend about 200 calories to clean rugs. What do we do now? Yeah. <laughs> right? We got the Roomba. Yeah, that's about 0.2 calories. <laughs> Press a button, and it goes. <laughs> 200 calories, 0.2 calories. One causes you to move. One allows you to do what you want to do, which is not move. <laughs> and so this is what I mean by the water. Our whole environment has been increasingly, uh, including our jobs and things, telling us to not move, and somehow, we're trying to build habits to work against that environment. Now, I'll finish this with one study that just came out in October 2018. I got to do a study because I'm from Stanford. Um, 120,000 uh, exercise treadmill tests that were done in Cleveland Clinic. Do you guys know what an exercise treadmill test is? Yeah, exercise treadmill test is something we use as physicians. You put them on a treadmill, put an EKG on, make sure their heart is OK. People that come in that I worry about chest pain, I'll put them on a treadmill test, make sure they're okay. And Cleveland Clinic, big heart center, had a lot of these from 1991 to about 2000, I think they studied it up to 2011. And so they took the treadmill test, about 120,000 people, average age about 54, 60% men. And then they followed all cause mortality from 2011 to 2017. They tracked who died. Right, all cause mortality. So of the 120,000 people, about 13,000 people died. Okay, they started the study, they tracked it from 91, 2017. Then they correlated what were traits and predictions about those people who died. They looked at things like, did they smoke? Did they have diabetes? Did they have hypertension? You know, did they have coronary artery disease? And they looked at how well did they do on their treadmill tests? Did they exercise at an elite level, or were they barely able to finish the test? And then they calculated retrospectively, what is the risk if you had smoking, heart disease, hypertension, and didn't finish the treadmill test? What do you think correlated the most direct to the people who died, all-cause mortality? 
Smoking, somebody said. Yeah, no, it was a treadmill test. Yeah, by about four times. If you look at the people who died in those period of years, 70% of them were the ones that didn't do well on the treadmill test, barely could finish it. It beat out smoking, it beat out diabetes, <laughs> it beat out coronary artery disease. And out of this, and you can look at the articles that came out, sedentary life worse than smoking. <laughs> if you don't move, you die. <laughs> That's, that's kind of, you know, it's kind of sensationalistic, but that's kind of the message here. That there's a direct correlation between our sedentary life and all-cause mortality. All right? It's sobering. It's not easy to fight against all our rumbas in our life. And so that's the setup. All right? That's the setup for what will be an excellent panel of speakers on how and why it's important that we think about working against our environment and doing the things that will make us healthier. So with that, I'd like to introduce um, uh, the next speaker, Iram, who works at the fitness center down in building Q. He's gonna teach us how to move and give us tips on how this integrates with our life. So, interesting. thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kwan. So I've had the privilege of working here at Cisco for now a little over 10 years. And one of the biggest things I like to do is just get people to move. Every day we move, we think, we move through all, and contemplate different processes here at work. We get trapped. We get trapped in our cubicle at work. And we're sitting, and we're sitting hours on ends. We have meeting after meeting after meeting, am I right? And what happens is we get those tight hip flexors, sore back, tight neck, and we forget that movement has such profound effects on our ability to think and process through various abstract subjects, just various things that we can do and process and think a little bit more of what we're doing and help us in our everyday work. So what we want to do is move more and bring that blood flow and move it throughout our body and allow us to think through these processes. There's a quote from Leila Ali that fit people are no different than anyone else. People who are fit are the same as, as us. The only difference is their level of commitment. What we want to do is we want to get you to move. And you have to dedicate yourself to move. And it's hard. We get stuck at the desk, all these meetings left and right. Before you know it, Three or four hours have passed, and you haven't moved. It becomes difficult. It has profound effect on our ability to think. It has profound effect on our ability to move, because we get so tight. And what does, that, what does that do? We start having depression, anxiety. All these other issues start to pop up, all because we just didn't want to move. So the one thing I'm going to do is how to move. How can we incorporate movement more into our everyday lives? Yes, I know it's tough. We all have busy schedules. But there's simple things that we can do to help us move more throughout the day. Here are a couple little snippets of things that we can do. Stand up and take your phone calls at your desk. Time for lunch. Maybe have a, you know, get up, move a little bit. If you have a, uh, an employee that's working, and we all work in teams, we all work in groups, right? And we're usually close-knit and work together. Why not just get up, go get a drink of water, and walk over to your fellow employee's desk and talk over the situation rather than pinging them when they're, what, four or five desks away from you? Or you can go to the gym. Life Connections Fitness Center, we're in RTP. We're in, I believe, Bangalore now. I believe we're, of course, here building Q. We're going to make it easy for you to, to move. We set you up with in a small, like uh, we call it our smart path. Everyone has a different one, but it's a, it's a complimentary session. We're going to introduce you into, into working out. And we're going to set up a workout plan for you and take you through the steps you need to keep you moving. And the trainers are going to hold you accountable. I see we have a couple trainers here. <laughs> we have one. 
We're going to hold you accountable and allow you to break through those little barriers, allow you to move a little bit more. There's other ways you can do. You can bike to work. You can use your smart devices. How many of you guys have iPhones or iWatches? Raise your hands if you have an iWatch. There should be abilities on those smart devices to allow you to set reminders to move if you've been sitting too long. And that typically ends up being our issues. We just sit too much. If we get up and move a little bit more, it's going to allow us to think through those complex strategies. And, and sometimes just taking a step away from the work that we're doing will allow us to better address those situations that, are, that we're dealing with at work. Now, work's not the only place that we're going to have issues where we don't move. When you're at home, playing Wii Fit or different various games, if you have children, going out playing with the kids, that that's definitely exercising, that's definitely moving. Okay, Even playing with your dogs, playing fetch, running around with them. I used to do the same thing. I used to wake up every morning and go run with my dog. We used to chase rabbits, jackrabbits, all, all over the place. It was fun, but that's how I got my cardio. I'm one of those people that doesn't like to run, but if I'm playing a sport or I'm playing something that I enjoy, it's going to get me moving, and it's going to help me think through all the different processes. How many of you have sat in the shower and have thought of something at work? Raise your hand if you've done that. There's many of us here that have done that. We're just moving. We're doing things. You're, you, whether we know, you're moving. You're showering your body, but we're thinking, and we're processing those different strategies that we can util utilize at work. Netflix, Hulu. How many of you guys watch all the new shows and all the other things out? The problem with those shows is we're sitting so much. We sit when we're at the office, and then we go home, and we're sitting again, and we're not moving. And all that's doing is, again, making those tight hip flexors, sore lower backs. The more we move and move through the different planes and get your body moving, again, the, more, the better you're going to feel. You're going to have more energy. Simple as doing push-ups or sit-ups during commercial breaks when you're watching TV. Or if you just you've noticed you haven't been doing much at all, get up and clean. Put on a record, your favorite music, your favorite song, and get up and dance while you're cleaning. What was that one show with uh, Tom Cruise? Uh, was it Risky Business? Where you see him sliding, just dancing in his, in his, in his undergarments? <laughs> Many of you have seen that. But just do that. You're moving. Okay. And it becomes difficult. I know it becomes difficult. There are times where I do the same thing. But I set reminders. Use your devices. Use the, small, use the technology to help you move. Now, when you're out and about, a lot of us, when we're out and about, we're not doing the things that we can to help us and keep us move. What do we do? We take the escalators rather than taking the stairs. We get lazy. It happens. I find myself doing it every once in a while. But now I challenge even my significant other. I challenge her. Every time we have an opportunity to either go up the escalators, I'll take a step and I'll try to beat her up the stairs by running up the stairs. But I'm moving. I'm keeping my body moving, always keeping my body moving. And that's the thing. We're not, our bodies aren't meant to just sit around. I've been a personal trainer for a little over 15 years now. I've worked with elite athletes that I've worked with the general public. But the key thing is movement and that level of commitment. That goes back to that quote that I said with Leila Ali. It's our level of commitment. Granted, those athletes have the big paycheck that they're, <laughs> that's motivating them to move. But granted, if they're not, their bodies are going to suffer for it. And a lot of times, that's what happens with us here. We don't move enough, and our body starts to suffer. One of our biggest muscles is this muscle here. But that mind-body connection is what's going to help us move more, think more, process more. So when you're out and about, park. Park maybe the extra three or four parking spots away from where your destination needs to be and go from there. If you're taking the train, public transportation, maybe stand rather than sitting. Because we sit all day. That's what we do. Half the time, we're sitting all day, whether we're in front of the TV, in your car, on the train, wherever. But we're sitting at your desk, sitting. The idea is to move. Again, take the stairs. Schedule activities when you're out and about. 
meaning do activities where you're gonna move, go hiking, maybe go biking, again, play with your dog, but do activities that are gonna help you move and get out there and get that blood flowing. Now, what do fit people do to stay fit? Anyone know? Anyone have any ideas of what people do to stay fit? No one? What was that? Eat healthy. Eat healthy. Yes, it's true. They eat healthy. Not all the time. Again, I've been a trainer for 15 years. I have clients who have not worried about the nutritional aspect. And as soon as they trigger just a little bit of that, you see a difference with that exercise. But the idea is we're not all going to eat healthy. One, it can be expensive. Two, not everybody's going to like the foods that generally are healthier for us. So it's ideal to have those cheat days, the days where you can have a little bit of a snack. But the idea is don't make the whole day a cheat day. You want to eat just a little bit. Have the piece of cake if you wanted to. I'm not saying to actually eat a piece of cake. But if you did, that's fine. But make sure you're doing the work and moving, keeping your body moving to work through that. So here's a couple of tips. Fit people don't diet. They make healthy eating part of their lifestyle. And that's the key point to do is make it part of your lifestyle. Find what you enjoy. If you enjoy jogging, you enjoy running, go for those extra runs. Go for those extra jogs. Just get out of the house and go. They prioritize fitness into their lifestyles. They, make, they go to the gym. They have a gym membership. Not everybody's always going to make it to the gym every day. I'll, I'm, I'm on it. I can say that I don't always make it to the gym. But if I find myself not going to the gym, that weekend I'm probably going for a nice hike. I'm going for a mountain bike ride, uh, excuse me, a mountain bike ride. Doing things that'll get me out and, out and about out of the house and moving. That's the key thing is to move. Again, we don't eat perfectly 100% of the time. It's just not, it's not gonna happen. Just, we all have indulges and, and, and vices that we love. Have them, but make sure you're getting enough sleep and make sure you are moving and exercising. Surround yourself with other fit people. Laziness will beget laziness. So move. Keep your body moving. Surround yourself with other people who are going to move. If you like sports, go play sports. That camaraderie right there is, is what's going to help you, motivate you to keep moving. I see a couple people in here that go to the fitness center. I see a couple of you guys there. And they love it. They work out. They train. Find new friendships. But what, else, what it's also going to do is allow us to network, especially here at Life Connections. If you go to Building Q or any of the other fitness centers that Cisco has, you're going to find new, new connections, ways to network within your own company. You get new ideas, maybe you know, find a new partner. Stay active outside the gym is one of the biggest key things that we can do. Just staying active, movement. Now there's going to come times when movement is going to hurt. It always happens. You know, we, we, we train, we work hard, and there's gonna be those times where we just can't move, and it hurts. Dr. Tony Kearns here, one of our chiropractors and sports athletic trainers at uh, Life Connections, is gonna tell you what you need to do when moving hurts. Tony? Okay. okay. Good afternoon, how are you guys? Pardon me while I use my notes here. It's my uh, sixth month in here at Cisco, so either this is gonna go really, really well or I won't see you guys tomorrow. All right, so we'll see how this plays out. Uh, I'm Tony Kearns, I like to only dress here. Uh, six months in, I came from St. Mary's College after 10 years of working for sports medicine, but I wanna re-echo or echo a comment that was said earlier, which is there's really not a significant difference between the low level you and me and those high level athletes, and I can say that because I've been doing this for 15 years. And our goal here today is to address that point of what can make me move, not what can make me Tom Brady, not what can make me LeBron James or Steph Curry. All right, hold on to that thought as we progress through. Our goal here today is to address these questions because we've addressed the idea or talked about the idea of what stops us from moving. And the first thing that pops into my head, knowing nothing about sports medicine or about movement is, oh, if it hurts, don't move it, right? Who's heard that? I heard it this weekend. My wife, love her dearly, Parker goes down in the basketball game, he comes off and falls, rolls his ankle, and there it goes. Don't move it, she yells from the stands. And I'm looking at him like, 
Give him a second. Let him get his composure. So we're going to address the ideas of what's the difference between exercise pain and that injury pain. If moving hurts, when should I stop? When should I stop? Keep that point in the back. If it hurt, what should I do? Where do I go? Who do I talk to? All right? And how do I self-assess that movement and avoid the injury? Parker knew to kind of take an inventory, figure out what happened with that ankle, and get up and stay in the game. Dylan Odsley, St. Mary's, four-year captain, two-year All-American, two-year national championship. He goes into this game. He knows exercise is going to hurt. He's not going to feel great on Sunday. All right? But exercise, even though it can hurt, is a normal response. It's called the law of adaptation. You place stress on your body. Your body will overcome that stress, adapt to it, learn from it, and you'll get bigger, faster, stronger. What happens if you don't move? You will hurt more. Why? Why? Because the research says so. <laughs> that was for Stanford. I told you I'm new here, so I had to, <laughs> had to earn my keep here. But actually, exercise affects every body system. Every body system. We know it talks about the heart. It helps the heart. We talked about the treadmill test, the nervous system, the brain, and anxiety, depression, mood, our attention or focus, that thought in the shower, uh, moving around. That's why. The frontal lobe cortex of the brain, blah, 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 that research. That's why. Your brain is being active because of one reason. Your GI, better. You're digesting that lunch today. Your skin, you don't have acne because you're sweating those toxins out to your body and excreting them. All right, but where I'd like to spend some time today in the area of our specialty here uh, for the chiropractors and, and physical medicine and athletic training, I'm sorry, uh, chiropractors, physical therapists and acupuncturists and physical medicine of building Q and across the other Cisco campuses is this piece. The musculoskeletal system, as Dr. Upside said, is made up of muscles, bones, joints, and nerves. All right, things like osteoporosis, arthritis, we have those maybe in our genetic past. But again, remember, low back pain, neck pain, shoulder pain, knee pain, that's what we're seeing on a daily basis. So if you would give me a moment to indulge me, I'm going to kind of like to tell you kind of why that happens and what's happening. But remember, that whole body system, that whole body system is affected from one simple process. And that's the movement of blood through our body. And what is carried through that blood? Oxygen. And what happens if we don't have oxygen? We die. And I hate to be morbid, but that's what happens. And that's the theme of today. We have to move. And it doesn't matter so much as to exactly how and necessarily what type of movement you like. We just want to move. And so give me one second to indulge you on a book right here by Dr. Kolsky and O'Connor, uh, two doctors out of the Chicago region. And they're going through this idea. And they wrote a book in 2015 that just came out recently that talks about the world of hurt. It's living a life versus living to your condition. And hopefully you guys at home can see this up close and those people in the room can, uh, can come forward if you need to. But here's Tony. Here's Tony's life. Pardon my kindergarten writing. Here's Tony's life, all right? And in Tony's life, there are processes within my life where I might get hurt. I might experience that pain. So down here, we got Tony's condition, all right? And my goal is to try to figure out how do I go through this ladder of life? How do I excel that corporate ladder? How do I get better? How would I become more successful? So where my life doesn't come down to my condition, instead, my condition goes up to my life. Now, here's what's really important. Did someone give me a red pen for a reason here? In either equation, this pathway, those rungs of that ladder, guess what's present? There's that pain. It hurt me to move that first day when I worked with Iram in the gym. It didn't feel good, buddy. It hurt to move that around. Was that my exercise pain or was that my injury pain? So one question you can ask yourself is, 
Is this postural base? Is this something where I haven't moved for a while and I'm experiencing pain between my mid back or my low back? Or was it that time of Parker on the court running down and rolling the ankle? Was he moving when this injury happened? In Building Q, we have that team of physical medicine specialists. And the things that we do simply on the first visit with you, right, is we ask questions. 90% of the diagnosis comes from the history. You guys are going to tell us what's wrong. We're just going to filter through that water that Dr. Kwan talked about and find out if somewhere swimming around is that fish with a musculoskeletal condition. All right, so 90% of the diagnosis, you're going to tell me this is what's wrong. And then we're going to say, OK, well, yeah. You actually haven't moved in nine hours. <laughs> Let's figure out how to rectify that. All right? Or, yes, you did sprain your ligament. So I'd like, if you wouldn't mind, never a good idea when the presenter takes off a jacket, right? It's scary. So I want to go through this process. So this would be an example of maybe something where I'm going to help differentiate and partner with you on saying, OK, is this a postural deficiency or is this a movement deficiency? And sometimes they overlap, right? So I'm sitting here. And I'm just going to ask you for an instance to raise your hands directly over your head. And we're going to sit and do this. Fantastic. I wasn't expecting this. This is great. All right. If I can get my hands all the way to the top, I'm going to bring them back down. Now, I'm going to tell you in this position, side profile, you're not expected to do so. I'm going to go this direction. All right. Now, I'm just going to watch you move. All right. A couple faults here. If I go up in this position and I flare my elbows, I'm looking at that. That's history. That's movement or not. My tricep might be tight. I might want to work out or recommend a massage, or I might go through and do some soft tissue. All right. I might say, I'm going to put this on a little notepad. When you go downstairs to work with Iram, I want to make sure that when they're doing a tricep extension that he understands. They might do that little massager on you. Whatever it is that gets you to mobilize that tissue so that you can raise up, that would be one reason. Another reason is your shoulder blade doesn't move very well. It's supposed to wing along your ribs. And if you sat like this all day long, and it goes from here, to here, it doesn't know how to retract to wing. So that's a postural-based deficiency. So we will use movement patterns to help us get through there. That low back pain that we're talking about, that's real. That's not fun. Traditionally, that's what drives people to see or speak to one of our doctors. Back pain is debilitating. So what I'm going to do is come in with low back pain. I'm going to try to see if we can elicit that back pain. Can I elicit it through movement? Or is it just when you're sitting here right now today? I'm going to stand. I'm going to bend over and, quote, touch my toes. Can I reach the ground? Do I keep my shins straight up and down? Is my head neutral? Is my back flat, or am I rounding like a roly-poly? OK? If you round your back like a roly-poly, you're increasing the greater load on your lumbar spine, your low back. And over a period of time, your low back doesn't like to be the only mover. So if this buddy, those two fish, one fish is the low back, and the other fish is the hips, and this low back fish is doing all the work, it's going to call a friend. And what the friend it should call is the hips. So when I go through this way to pick up that box, it might be a little better idea to pick up that box this way. And we hear it, but that's a learned pattern. We have to floss that pattern. You have to learn how to move that pattern through its full range of motion before you try to load it. So don't take those 35-pound dumbbells and hang them over the side and do this and roll that back, and then figure out, uh-oh, how do I get back up from here? Not a good idea. So we're not going to add a weight. We're not going to add a speed or add a resistance unless you have that full range of motion. So that slide earlier that says, how do I know when to stop to move? If you're down there and you get low back pain through movement, you better drop those weights. That would be a good idea to prevent further injury. So guess what? Let's self-assess. Please stand up. Uh-oh, groans in the audience. Here we go. You ready? Let's clear out those lunches. If we got jackets, we'll move those to the side. We got TV people at home, right? Go ahead and clear your desks. Let's get ready, guys. All right. We're going to jog in place. Introduce yourself to your neighbor. Try not to take them out. Are we ready? Go. Just jog. Whatever pace feels comfortable to you. How much time do we have here today? <laughs> How are we doing? All right. Five. Four, three, two, one. Rest. How do we feel? Heart rate's up a little bit, right? Bounce on your right foot. Wait for it. Come on. Get them up. Hold it. I'm checking your balance. Can you stand without wobbling? We'll get to that later. Let's hold it. 
five, four, three, two, one. How are we? And we got two feet. Left foot. You guys are really kicking yourself. You're not at home watching on TV, right? And you're like, oh, now he can look at us. Balance. We good? How we doing? Good. Relax. Have a seat. Stand up. Please, please and thank you. Have a seat. Stand up. I'm just kidding. Have a seat, have a seat, have a seat, have a seat. That's a sit-stand test. I will use a sit-stand test in the office. That low back pain that hurt here, you rounded your back. You'll go into what we call flexion. It's a slight little bending of the back. You're not straight up over top. You load the front of your back rather than bend from those hips in my sit-stand test. So my athletes, my engineers, my whomever, my son, doesn't matter. When they're getting up, this is, oh, I should have got a better chair. I'm not six feet tall. So I go from here and I go to stand up. I don't want to drive forward. I want to stand up. Here's what we see in the office occasionally. People with acute low back pain and a natural adaptation to pain, they'll bend forward and they use this. It's called minor sign. It's known in the medical literature to support and say, I'm trying to protect my low back. All right? So we're looking for those movements. We're looking for those movement deficiencies of which joint is moving more compared to something that's not moving. And we try to equate those balance patterns. How many of you saw deficiencies in yourself? All right, nobody wants to say it, right? How many saw deficiencies in our neighbor? There it is. There it is. So I'd like to go through here real quick and let the experts kind of talk through this in the squat. And this really breaks it down because, again, movement is key. We go back to that idea of if you're moving, you might have some movement deficiencies and pain that we need to address. And that's probably when you should get help. If you have pain with a loss of motion or pain with a loss of strength, I physically can't lift my leg with that low back pain. We want to know about that. All right? But if you physically just can't move because you haven't moved for six hours, let's start with that and do your self-assessment. Take an inventory. When Dylan Odsley takes that hit in rugby, head's here, hips are here, ankle, self-assessment, self assessment I'm good. Next play. All right? Play the video, please. So we can challenge your body from that double leg squat, that sit-stand test from this dimension. We can make you be unbalanced, that balanced leg test, and get you to squat with one leg forward and one leg back. What we're looking at here is now we can load you. There's a machine in the, in the gym downstairs, right, Iron, where there's a rods on both sides where you're first learning to squat. You don't know how to do that, so we'll put the weight there, but you got those little rungs to protect you just in case you fatigue out. And going to fatigue is a great way to train. To do a training process of five sets of 20 at high intensity when you've never squatted before may not be the best way to start your exercise on January 1st. I'm looking for your knees to collapse. Those people that stand up from the squat and they do this, and they got knock knees, that's not good. That's going to tell me right there that you might have a tight groin muscle. That needs to be opened up. You might have a fallen arch. We might tell you to go see one of our podiatrists, and Dr. Kwan might refer you out. All right? But there's numerous reasons, whether it comes from those muscles. They're just too tight or they're overused. We need a better balance. It could be something structurally or we need to support it. Or it could just be motor learning. You need to floss that pattern over and over and over again until your brain jumps in and says, hey, I know how to do this now. When we developed as babies, we didn't go directly from rolling over to our tummies to standing. We learned how to crawl. It's a developmental pattern, and that developmental pattern works both ways. That baby went up to its life. In our world, after 10 years of not exercising and saying that New Year's resolution of not actually ascertaining that goal, we went down to our condition, and it did not change. So in building Q and all over an IRM or maybe on your own, you're going to do exercises such as this. We might give you movement patterns. We're going to give you movement patterns that help strengthen that. I might give you some corrective exercises to help yourself. Oh, we got a video there replaying. I might say, hey, let's just get a band. Go at home and do some self-mobilization. Move your joint through a proper range of motion. Again, we're teaching you how to move on your own. You can't make it to, to building nine. Can't make it to building Q? That's OK. Do your homework. And we'll walk you through those processes of corrective exercises. Who wants to jog? All right, we'll just watch the experts. Play the video, please. So for example, some of you may be in that heart rate zone. You're running a nine-minute mile. 
Don't worry about the pace of the nine minute mile. Worry about your heart rate and staying aerobic, okay? What you'll notice is over time, typically over about six to eight weeks of running at that same heart rate, let's say example, it's 145 beats per minute. Instead of running a nine minute mile, you'll start running an 855 mile or an 850 mile. By staying in that aerobic zone, that again is your typical speed and that speed will increase as your fitness increases. Stop the video there. What he said was very important, and that was the idea of cardio, the movement side we've talked about, we really hammered that home. But people that go in through these deficiency patterns of movement patterns, they add that weight, they add those reps, they see something and they heard, oh, my friends, colleagues, brothers, sisters, nephew told me to do it this way. It doesn't really matter. That's not a good way to prescribe exercise and movement. That could lead to injury. What is important is measuring yourself against yourself. Get that technology, that Apple Watch, and find what your resting heart rate is. Find out where you are right now sitting here listening to me talk. And then let's figure out what elevates that heart rate that makes you feel good after that 20 second jog. What's that number? Use quantitative data, right, to say, where do I feel good? That's the blood circulating through your body. So what the strength coach is getting at is don't worry about running the rock and roll half marathon at sub 10. That's silliness. If you don't like to run on a treadmill, run outside. We've talked about all those ideas, but it's really, really important on that jog to know your baseline, and you can build from your baseline. That technology that we talked about, that Fitbit, let's spend some time on that. Let's invest in your future with things like that and not that rumba. So what do physical experts do? We're going to watch you move. We'll go through that process. We're going to feel you move. We might put our hands on you and check that range of motion, all right? And teach you the right movement pattern. We've said that. Teach you how to move before we increase the loads. Once you've learned how to move, we're going to ask you to start to identify areas where that pain might be helpful and when that pain is destructive. Again, in summary, have you lost some motion? Have you lost strength while performing a movement? Ask yourselves that and remember that key point. And if you haven't, Keep going with your exercise. Keep working. Eventually, you'll get a healed injury, all right? And then we want you to really hold on to that idea of use your community to keep you driving through this process. And that's what's great about Cisco. You guys have people to left, right, upstairs, downstairs, all around you, and leaders like G that really will practice what they preach. And they self-assess, am I good? I got everything, fantastic. And they're proactive. The chair test, that full range of motion, and that range of motion through acceptable limits of pain. And if that continues over a period of time, come talk to us. It's Parker, love that kid. Even after eliminating all that pain, even after mastering those mo movements. Play the video. Hello, here I go to play you audio there? baseball. I am practicing for my first game. So Parker at five yeah. years old said, this is my Let me know first you're ready. try for baseball. Practice. <laughs> oh. <Nice. laughs> ready? Then we focus on speed with movement. So never throw in the towel. Always know you can move through a full range. Always know that you can move with weights. Always know we'll build up to weights on an unstable surface. And then always know that we'll go on an unstable surface with flying tennis balls at your head from your five-year-old son. Because there's never a threshold. It's your level of commitment. If you're committed, Cisco and our team at Stanford over in Building Q and across the networks of Cisco will be there to help you. You just got to go ask for it, and we'll be there for you. I want to thank you guys for your time today. Next up is Dr. Todd Alleman. Todd Alleman is going to talk to us about those times here when we cannot move and that pain is too bad. He's going to tell us what we can do. Thanks, Doc. So kind of changing gears here a little bit, I, I, but I want to highlight everything that was said before. For almost all musculoskeletal problems that we run into, the things that were outlined here, movement, um, eating well, exercising, thinking about your posture, uh, trying to do things at work that keep you a little bit more active are enough. Um, when we have injuries, conservative management can typically take care of, of, of most of them. 
But I'm a surgeon, and so I'm going to talk about some other things. Because sometimes we run into mechanical problems that just have to be dealt with in other ways when conservative things don't matter. So this may be of less interest to people, but uh, I'll, I'll go through some uh, things we think about from uh, a surgical perspective. And then just in case anyone's queasy, there's some videos that we'll go into as well, which you can uh, ditch out of the room for if, if that's too much. But anyway, hopefully this will be of some interest. So as surgeons, uh, we're sort of mechanical people. All that we can do really to the body and, and, and to the anatomy that's perhaps to blame for the pain that someone's having is affect it mechanically. So what are the typical things that we can do? Well, the most common thing that we do as spine surgeons is take the pressure off a nerve or a spinal cord that's being compressed in a way that isn't resolving with conservative management. Um, things that can compress the nerve are degenerative problems, so bone spurs. Uh, disc herniations are very common in people who are sedentary. Um, other times, other things develop, like tumors that are sort of oddball things that can compress nerves and cause problems that don't go away with reasonable treatment uh, from a conservative perspective. Um, there are also instability patterns and deformity problems that people can have that are very dramatic that we can treat surgically. But the mainstay of what we do is take the pressure off nerves um, through removing or trimming down whatever structure is causing a problem. Um, so uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about more modern techniques of spinal surgery. I think when most people think about spinal surgery, they think about huge incisions and tons of bleeding and lots of pain and people in bed for extended periods of time. There are a lot of modern techniques in, in spinal surgery, which we put to work when we can. Um, you'll sometimes hear the term minimally invasive spinal surgery. What does that really mean? Well. In the end, we have to accomplish our mechanical goal, right? We have to take the pressure off a nerve. We have to take out a tumor. We have to take out a disc herniation. Um, we've got to correct a deformity. We've got to deal with an instability problem. But really, we want to achieve that while causing as little collateral damage as possible. And that has resulted in a bunch of techniques that are applicable to, to problems that people can run into. Um, so this term, minimally invasive spinal surgery, which some may have heard of, is really two things. It's, it's an approach to the patient, trying to figure out very specifically what their problem is and what their problem is not. Because we all know as we get older and if we're over the age of 30, if you get an MRI scan of people who are perfectly fine, have no complaints of back pain, we're going to see a lot of things that could potentially be surgical targets. We've got to be very careful about only targeting the things that are causing the, the problem that a patient is complaining of. Um, and then we typically will approach the spinal pathology using a technique that disrupts the anatomy as little as possible. Using a minimally invasive technique in a way to accomplish a goal that's not minim minimally invasive doesn't really make a surgery minimally invasive. So using a technique for no reason doesn't make any sense. We've got to accomplish a very specific goal. And, and that involves being very careful uh, similar to the talk we just heard, at really understanding what the patient's problem is. Um, we have to really understand what sort of person the patient is. What are their comorbidities? Can they tolerate whatever intervention that we're thinking about? What's their complaint? Uh, we, if, we, if we don't listen to the complaint of the patient, we're going to miss the diagnosis much of the time. We've got to make sure that the exam that we elicit when we examine someone makes sense when matched with their complaint and also makes sense with their imaging study that we'll often get uh, to allow us to come to a conclusion that there's, yes, one specific thing that's causing this patient's specific complaint and causing their specific abnormalities on physical exam. So when all these things come together, um, now we have a diagnosis, now we have a target, um, now we can understand uh, what the treatment goal should be. So we have to do a careful physical exam. Uh, the great thing about the way we're all constructed is that nerves have very specific distributions in terms of the pain that they cause a patient or the numbness that they cause a patient. If the third lumbar nerve is causing a problem, we know that that's going to cause pain radiating into the front of the thigh. If it's the fifth lumbar nerve, it's the back of the thigh and the front side of the lower leg. So these things all have to go along together. If that fifth lumbar nerve is a problem, 
Oftentimes the big toe extensor will be a bit weak and maybe the ankle muscle that allows us to walk up on our heels. So all these things have to make sense. We've got to make sure that the problem is coming from the spine, for instance, and not the peripheral uh, part of the nervous system. So uh, everything's got to come together. We've got to make sure that we don't come to a patient with a specific diagnosis in mind and make the data that we see fit into that uh, foregone conclusion that we had when we walked in the room by looking at the imaging study first. So I tell all my residents and fellows who train with us to always examine the patient, listen to the history first before we look at the imaging studies uh, because uh, we can get trapped into that Foucault's pendulum uh, problem, which a lot of you know about. So well, we have to establish uh, the diagnosis with precision. Sometimes we have to order specialized tests uh, that you may have heard of. Uh, nerve studies, uh, EMGs can sometimes be useful, uh, but typically we can get the diagnosis without that. Sometimes we can use what are called differential injections. So we can inject part of the body. For instance, if someone has pain in their neck that radiates to their shoulder, sometimes that can be caused by a shoulder problem, a rotator cuff problem that I think we've heard about before. Other times it can come from the neck. Simplest way to diagnose that is to do a quick injection in the space just above the rotator cuff. If the pain goes away, we know it's a shoulder problem. If it doesn't, it's more likely to be a neck problem. So we'll oftentimes use these to be very specific about the diagnosis that we're treating. When someone comes to me with a problem and they're absolutely miserable, I know they have a disc herniation and it's been a week, I know that they're likely to get better with, when treated conservatively because the natural history of that problem is actually very good. In the old days, people used to get rushed in the operating room with disc herniations, but the reality is we know if we send you to a physical therapist, if we put you on anti-inflammatories, if we give you some specific exercises, you're likely to get better. So we really have to understand the natural history of the problem that they have to know how to direct that patient in the early going. Uh, there's a lot of non-surgical treatment alternatives, which we've discussed some uh, earlier. A lot of times they should be tried first before thinking about something surgically. And then we got to be, as surgeons, and this is more for me and my uh, uh, cohort than, than you, we got to be careful about making sure that we only treat problems that we can fix surgically. Uh, people have heard about people having spine surgery and not getting any better. More often than not, that's because it was used to treat a problem for which the results are very unpredictable. So we've got to stick to what works. When we decide that a patient's going to benefit from a spinal surgery if done properly, we've got to figure out what's the, what's the best surgery to treat them uh, in a way that's lasting without creating other problems. Um, uh, what do I need to decompress? Do, do they actually need a fusion? Typically, we don't need to do one. Um, what kind of anesthetic should that be done under? A lot of times we can do uh, decompressions of nerve roots under local anesthetic. And for people who are older and might not tolerate uh, general anesthetic for whatever reason, that's a reasonable option. Um, what are the major advances over the last 20 years or so? Well, there's a lot better imaging than when I first started into this business. MRI scans are better. Dynamic films are better. Um, the operative microscopes that we use, and I'll show you some pictures of those in just a second, are a lot better than they used to be, so we can really see what we're doing well, uh, and we can look into deep spaces and be able to see in three dimensions and, and operate in that way. Um, retractor systems are a lot better, and in the end, the, the net effect is less collateral damage with improved exposure. Here's an image of the operative microscope that I use in almost every surgery. So uh, there are two head pieces, one for the assistant, one for the surgeon, and then uh, the portal that looks into the patient is this one right here. We can get really great imaging uh, with a, a lot of magnification and great light that allows us to do a lot of things that just was not technically possible 30 or 40 years ago. These retractor systems that are tube-based, really simple invention, but has a lot of applications in the spine as in other areas. That allows us to get down to the deep anatomy without doing much. Uh, up higher and through the muscle bed that we sometimes have to go through. This, so this is a cross-sectional image of the spine with, for instance, a disc herniation down in through here, the bony parts of the spine here, and you can see the tube traversing the muscle in a way that disrupts it a lot less. This is what that looks like uh, from the outside. 
so that being said, again, if anyone's queasy, it's the time to leave the room. Uh, so this is a <laughs> for examples of things that we treat surgically. I thought this might be of interest. This is a 28-year-old gentleman who had a complaint of severe thoracic back pain at night. He did stretching and physical therapy, and this just beleaguered him every night. He had temporary relief with anti-inflammatories, and that's an important clue to think about a specific diagnosis here. Uh, it was in his thoracic spine. It occasionally radiated around to his chest. He's otherwise healthy, and it had been going on for over six months. So at that point, with that much of a complaint that hadn't gotten better over a reasonable period of time, some imaging studies were obtained. And uh, we're looking at the spine from the side here, the vertebras here. The back part of the spine is here. And what we saw in this MRI scan is this really bright area right in through here, which was suggestive of what is called an osteoid osteoma. So it's a benign bone tumor that people can get and cause them persistent complaints at night. When you look at the CAT scan here, so this is done in the opposite plane, you can see the front of the vertebra, this part here, the back part, and this abnormal looking density right here uh, in the back part. And so that, that was the typical appearance of an osteoid osteoma. And this is the kind of thing that's relatively easy to get to and resect. Um, and causes persistent trouble that tends not to get better when treated in other directions. So uh, let's uh, turn the video on if we can. So uh, we're looking at the back part of the spine here. This is an 18 millimeter tube. These instruments are about two millimeters. And that tumor that we saw on the CT scan is this spot right here. So on the other side of the room, uh, that's that area right there. You see this at that, is that sort of ball. So what do we do as a surgeon? It's, it's a mechanical thing. We get down to this area without disrupting it too much, uh, clear up the space around it, and uh, very satisfied. Oop, take the tumor out. And then the patient's a lot better. So we'll see it coming out in just a second there. So anyway, that's kind of neat. So, um, and then we sort of clean up the mess. So, so that's an example of a, a spinal tumor treated with one of these approaches. Um, here's another real common example. Probably somebody in this room has been told they have spinal stenosis. So this patient is a 68-year-old gentleman who has pain in his back that radiates to his leg when he stands and walks. And uh, got this MRI scan. Uh, we're looking at, again, the spine from the side. The nerve roots are gray in the spinal canal here between the back of the fronts of the vertebra and the front of the backs of the vertebra. The white around it on this image sequence is spinal fluid. And so we can see there's a lot of compression here at three different spots in his spine where we can see there's no white around the nerve roots. So here, quick thing again, everybody put their hand on the small of their back. If you stand up, you'll feel your back rotates into extension. We've got to try that. So your back rotates into extension. This is the skin that you have your hand on. This is the front part of the spine. If the spine rotates around this point, you can imagine if it extends, that's going to pinch the nerve root further. And that's typically why people with this problem have pain when they stand that gets better when they sit. So anyway, this guy has lumbar canal stenosis. He didn't get better over a long period of time. Um, we got cross-sectional images that uh, I'll just sort of skip over, but showed that uh, this area was very compressed in three spots. <laughs> Um, so, and this is kind of what that looks like surgically. So let's go to the next video. So again, we're looking at the spine through a small, uh, through an 18 millimeter tube. This is the bony part of the uh, spinal elements. That ligament that was thick is this yellow stuff in him. That's a two millimeter burr that's burring down some of the bone on the edge that we've got sort of magnified up with this microscope. So we're the goal of this surgery is to remove this ligament and some of the surrounding bone. And you can see that's being done with this uh, tool that looks enormous, but it's two millimeters. Um, and underneath that is the fat overlying the nerve root. So it's kind of an interesting, interesting look into anatomy. And then you'll see that as we uh, remove those structures, we'll see the nerve roots right in through here. Uh, you can see the nerve root probe going over them. We'll get a better view of that in just a second. So that's the nerve root sac right in through there. And there's uh, the nerve heading out to the leg this way. So that, that's a way of making sure the space around the nerve root is opened up. Um, 
These problems, as was discussed earlier, can happen not only in the back, but in the neck. This is a, a patient who has what's called cervical canal stenosis. This is a, a 67-year-old gentleman with two years of right arm pain. And a uh, little bit hard to see, but you can see there's a little bit of narrowing around his spinal cord right here at the C67 level. And on this cross-sectional image in the opposite plane, there's some narrowing around that nerve as it exits to go out to the arm this way through what we call the foramen on the side. So these people typically hurt when you, they, they extend their necks and rotate off to the side that's problematic. That causes pain that radiates down their right arm. And um, can, in this gentleman, cause weakness in their triceps muscle. That's part of the C7 nerve root distribution. The guy's otherwise healthy. Uh, problem just hadn't been getting better over time. Uh, here's a quick, uh, it's kind of hard to see, but the, the C7 nerve comes out between the C6 and 7 uh, vertebrae. So here's the lamina, the back part of the spine of C6, the lamina of C7, uh, the facet joint right here, and then the nerve's going to run right underneath that. So let's go to the video there that I think is next. This is going to be pretty hard to appreciate. I don't know if these lights can come down. But, um, so again, same thing, uh, tube down to that anatomy. This instrument is removing some of the bone overlying the nerve to open up the space around it. And as that proceeds, we'll progressively uh, see the nerve uh, exiting right in this spot to go out to the arm. So this uh, removal of these uh, bone spurs overlying the nerve root itself results in a situation in which this is, a, again, a, a one millimeter probe that can be passed along that nerve. And we see the nerve running right out this way. So we do that until the nerves uh, clear. Um, uh, last uh, one real quick. Let's see the thing turned off. I don't know if we can turn that back on again. Let's go to the next slide. I don't know if you can help me. The uh, next slide's not coming up here. Let's see. Well, I guess we can just turn on this video. So this is a, a, a gentleman with a, a younger person with a big disc herniation compressing his nerve on the side of the spinal canal. Um, who again didn't get better with conservative management. Different problem than the last one. And we're looking here at the front of his neck. Uh, this is the upper vertebra, this is the lower vertebra. This is the very back of the disc. So we've gone in through the front, through an incision in the front, to get to the back of the uh, disc here and remove the part that's compressing the nerve, which is exiting right out to the side. So his head's up this way, uh, lower part of his neck is this way. Once that's done, uh, we're in the middle of putting in a, a cervical disc replacement here to basically fill the void that we've created by taking the, the disc herniation that was compressing the nerve out. So I'll give you a quick look at what that looks like. Um, so that's, that's kind of what an artificial disc replacement looks like. So uh, metal that interacts with the bone above and below and then the moving surface right in through here. So anyway, kind of a quick view of some of the things that we do in spine surgery. Um, uh, that's all I have for you today. So again, hopefully all the things that they talked about earlier keep you out of my office. But uh, I thought it'd be interesting to look at a little bit of what we do. All right, so we're going to go to a little bit of a different place right now. We're going to talk about the benefit structure so that all of you understand when you have health insurance at Cisco, how it works and how we work with you. So Caitlin Johnson's going to take over here. She's uh, manager of uh, our integrated benefits and our health centers, um, daycare centers, and then all of our gyms. Thank you, Dr. Updike. Is this working? Yes, great. I won't be up here too long, because right after me, we're going to do a uh, Q&A. So we do want your questions both live in the, in the room and on Cisco TV. Uh, as Dr. Updike said, I'm responsible for Life Connections. So I wanted to explain what Life Connections is. We hosted the event today, so we do appreciate your participation. We have several health centers around the globe right here in Building Q on the San Jose campus. It is a medical center. It's a multi disciplinary medical center which, which with many providers. We also have one in RTP, North Carolina, and then Bangalore, India. 
We also have the Life Connections Fitness Centers, and you can see the list there, uh, quite a few locations around the globe. And then Children's Learning Centers, two here on campus, one in Bangalore, India, and also Bedfont Lakes. Um, important note about the health centers, which are medical centers, is all Cisco employees, and here in the US, your dependents are eligible to use the centers, regardless of what medical plan you're on, or regardless of um, where you live or where you work, okay? Um, a few other programs that we're very proud of in our benefits uh, realm is our resiliency programs. This is called Mindset. You've probably seen the digital signage. Uh, I do encourage you to participate in these type of resiliency programs. This is an emotional uh, program that helps you really manage your stress and manage your day. We also have health coaching across the US. Um, this is by Vita, and it's all very high tech through your smartphone. And then for your financial wellness, we have My Secure Advantage and money coaches. So we have more than health coaches and physicians to help you. We also have money coaches. And then for your kids, we have College Coach. You can find all of this on the US Benefits Portal, and we have HR support lines. In addition, because we did invite the Canada folks to attend, we have robust Canada um, benefits, up to $400 for um, uh, services like chiropractic care through physi physiotherapists, which is physical therapy, and then up to $25,000 for things like uh, occupational therapists, psychologists, et cetera. So thank you for joining. I'm going to hand the baton back to Dr. Updike, and it's time for you to ask your questions. All right. Thank you, Caitlin. So those of you in the room that have questions, we have a couple of mics that are going to go around. Just raise your hand. We'll get to you. Um, there are also, there's an opportunity if you're online to be able to write in a question, and we'll, we can collate some of those. So um, you're, when you're thinking of a question, uh, this is live, and it's going to be on YouTube. So you might not want to talk about personal issues. Um, we we kind of want to keep questions to things that are pertinent, maybe to a learning experience for everybody in the room. But whatever you got, we'll uh, bring up our experts, and we'll, uh, we'll answer. Oh, hi. Uh, just a quick question. Are you guys going to share all the slideshow that you had today? Pretty useful. Yes, we're going to share the slides for all of you who attended. You'll get an email with the slide deck and the recording, but we'll also put it on CiscoLifeConnections.com. Back again, in the back row. For the uh, spinal surgeon, uh, doctor, could you share your uh, perspective on uh, chioplasty, or if that's pr correct pronunciation, the injection into the spine? So there's a couple potential things that you're talking about. There's uh, something called a kyphoplasty, um, which is a procedure that's uh, done to treat vertebral fractures. So a lot of times in uh, particularly osteoporotic uh, folks, uh, as we get older, we develop compression fractures or fractures in, uh, in the uh, front part of the vertebral body. Um, and those can cause prolonged pain and disability in some people. They typically will heal over about six weeks. When they don't heal over a period of about six weeks, uh, sometimes kyphoplasty, which was a procedure developed right here in the Bay Area, is performed for that. And that involves uh, putting a little uh, balloon in the vertebra to sort of push it in the right position, and then putting uh, bone cement in behind that to hold the fractured pieces in place. So that definitely works well in uh, appropriately uh, selected folks. But again, back to the natural history comment that I made before, for most people with fractures, they'll heal in a real reasonable period of time. It's always better to heal organically if you can. So, but I, I think it has, a, it has a real significant role. Yeah, up here in front. Uh, it's me. So uh, I, I joined Cisco and uh, Nuan. Most of the company I have before, they pay for the gym. You do, we don't have to pay for a gym. So what's the philosophy around uh, Cisco asking people to gym? Are they, I thought that it's supposed to promote a more healthy style. Have you been to our fitness center here in Building Q yet? Yeah. OK. It's a world-renowned corporate fitness center. It's a small nominal fee to join, but we find that people who pay a little bit, they tend to come more. 
when we did offer gyms that were free, they weren't as good. We had 10,000 members and 5,000 users. Now I have over 6,000 members and 6,000 users. We do have other fitness centers across the globe that are free, but they're not at this scale. And what comes with your fitness membership is many amenities, right? All the group exercise classes, state-of-the-art, high-tech equipment, wonderful trainers, and all the amenities in the, in the locker rooms that you typically don't even find in a typical gym in the community unless it's very high end and you pay $200, $300 a month. And then I can, I can add a little bit more to that. Um, so at the fitness center, you're typically when you go to a, another fitness center within the Bay Area or wherever you're at, you're not going to get a lot of the amenities and uh, some of the tools that we give you at our uh, at the fitness center. So we have tires, battle ropes, kettlebells, all the, the new and um, the new devices, the new uh, gadgets that the fitness industry is using, we're providing those there at the fitness center. And a lot of new f facilities, whether it's 24 hour fitness or any of the other fitness facilities, they're not typically gonna always have those um, abilities there for you. Okay, okay. In front. Uh, this for the sergeant doctor. Uh, there are problems like uh, tearing off of the ligaments or a labrum, uh, these things can be avoided by exercise or the surgery is to be done? So I, I think you're referring to uh, some shoulder problems that involve uh, uh, ligament injuries. Um, a lot of times those injuries can be rehabbed. So not every rotator cuff tear needs to be treated surgically. Uh, in fact, it's probably the minority that needs to be treated surgically. Um, uh, usually those can be treated with rehab um, because of the redundancy in our own bodies. Yeah, I'm referring to the hip side, hip side of the hip, hip area. Hip area. The hip area. So, I, I'm sorry. So the hip and the shoulder are kind of similar in some respects. They both have a joint socket and then they have a soft tissue structure called the labrum which sort of extends around that. Um, part of our body's natural sort of degenerative process involves some disruption of that labrum as, as we get older. So basically, if you take MRI scans of anyone over 50, you're going to see a labral tear in, in the hip. Sometimes those can become painful. That, again, does not mean they need to be treated surgically. There's a lot of non-operative measures that can be used to treat them. And there's a lot of controversy right now uh, in the orthopedic field of uh, uh, about patients who have some early degenerative change in their hip and labral tears. Uh, some people think there's a role for surgery for that. Some people think it's really something best treated non-operatively. But certainly, having a labral tear in the hip does not mean you need to have surgery for that. Yeah, from a historical perspective at, at Building Q, we see an awful lot of hip problems, all of these problems. And we have very, very few people that ever have to go to surgery. Um, it's, it's not that common. So the vast majority, and we know if you, typically what's gonna happen is before they're gonna go to somebody like Dr. Alleman, or we actually, since you're a spine surgeon, we actually use some other surgeons for hips and shoulders. Um, they wanna know that they've failed what we do before they go to them because oftentimes, no matter really what shows on an MRI or an X-ray or what the problem is, it typically will respond to conservative care. So um, you're actually in very good hands in, um, at Life Connections Health Center. Uh, we have some questions from the internet. Thank you. We do have several participants on Cisco TV, and I want to thank them for joining us. Um, and also that if we're not able to get all of their questions, we will uh, answer them directly after the session. Um, but because today's topic is particularly focused on movement, I did want to address, ask some of those questions on their behalf first. Um, one of the questions is, um, what do the studies show in particular about how often we should be moving throughout the day, um, you know, every hour throughout the day? Uh, what, what is the right amount of movement? Uh, I think the American College of Sports Medicine uh, has us, I might have my numbers wrong, correct me, Dr. Kearns, if you, if you know. I believe it's 90 minutes within a week. About 100, 150 minutes a week, we've elevated it, right? The current literature is supported 120. We have about 150 minutes of aerobic activity, whatever that be. You spread that out in any increment you want. And I think it goes to uh, the earlier point that we heard, which is if you can spread that out over the period of time, then you don't wait to do that all on the weekend and risk an injury because you 
got hit by a Mack truck by trying to run that mountain for 150 minutes. So I, uh, I, the current literature does support 120 to 150 uh, data. So I'll, I'll add to that. There was a really good study done in 2002 on pre-diabetics. Uh, those are people who are at risk of becoming diabetic. These are A1Cs between 5.6 to 6.5. If you take a group of pre-diabetics and you don't do anything, they don't move, they don't exercise, 33% of them will become diabetic in five years. About 33%, about one in three. Now if you tell that group to exercise, and this is where the 150 minutes come in, of moderate exercise, 150 minutes of moderate exercise, reduce their weight by 7%, you decrease the 33% conversion rate down to 15%. You have it. And so the number that I get for 150 minutes is it's tied to that study. Uh, and moderate exercise is interesting. There's a heart rate definition. Uh, an easier definition is breathing. So if you're doing your exercise and you can have a full conversation, that's light. If you're doing your exercise and you can't sing, without taking the breath, row, row, row your boat. That's moderate. If you're doing your exercise and you can't finish your sentence, that's vigorous. So 150 minutes of moderate exercise per week shown to decrease your chance of being pre-diabetic. So that's, that's, that's some of the studies on that particular number. I'm gonna answer it a little bit differently. Um, when you sit, there's a certain period of time that you can actually sit with your body not deforming or changing you into the position that you've all been in. Um, and I unfortunately don't remember the exact study, but I remember the time, and it was 12 minutes. Within 12 minutes, your body actually starts to get stiff and starts to make you look that way. Bent forward, shoulders forward, head forward, which is why when you stand up, your shoulders might be stiff in the front of your chest, your hip flexors might be tight. So getting up frequently and standing and moving is extremely important. You have another one from? Great, thank you. Um, yeah, another one is, um, is there a correlation between cold weather and lower back pain? And in particular, this um, person is wondering um, that he's having um, for the past several years, every two to three days, lower back spasms and, and want to know um, other than exercise because that doesn't seem to be helping um, what you might recommend. Anybody want to? An anecdotally, again, I, this would delve deeper into figuring out the current literature, so I use my colleagues, but I would say anecdotally, we, I find more that this the act of it being cold causes sedentary lifestyle. People don't want to go out and move through there. Uh, and in certain regions, it's the level of pressure, right? And so if you have a certain level of pressure on your body, whether cold stress is a reality, if you're an outdoor worker, et cetera, maybe you're doing a vibratory work outdoors, something along those lines. If there's multiple components of increasing pressure to a disc, that might be what we call provocative or more painful for, the, uh, for an individual. Uh, but I, I, I wouldn't know specific on whether or not just the act of cold weather um, is directly correlated to a, to a lumbar disc issue. So my experience in Q is I've treated an awful lot of people here, and then they go to India for an extended period of time. And what happens when they go to India and then they come back, they go, why did my pain go away when I went to India, and now I come back here and it hurts? And I, my answer is, I'm not really sure. Maybe, because it's warm there. You know, muscles and tendons work better when they're warm. Yes, absolutely. But you're also walking around when you're in India. You're not sitting, you're not working. And so I think it's a combination. I, I don't think the heat hurts. I don't think cold causes the problem, but certainly inactivity would make your back a lot stiffer. Great, thank you. And final question uh, for a minute here from, from the Cisco TV uh, is around, what are your projections for somebody who's currently sedentary to be able to um, get up and moving and to get into a, you know, a, a more fit um, lifestyle? Like how, how long does that take them, um, in particular uh, for somebody who's around 55 years old? I'd suggest just get moving. That's the biggest thing we can honestly say is regardless of your age, the first key, like we said, that quote from um, Leila Ali, is your level of commitment. You have to first just move. The biggest thing is just to start moving. Uh, if you come to Life Connections, we make it easy for you. We give you complimentary sessions 
uh, with the trainer to help you get you going. We give you a workout plan and let you know the steps, teach you all the things that you need to do in order to keep moving. You saw in the slides that I, uh, I presented earlier, like just the, the small little itty bitty things that you can do throughout the day to keep you moving are the key factors that you can do in order to, to start. But the biggest thing is I would say is you just have to start. Now, I'll just add to that in my primary care settings, um, the two things I would say, small goal, uh, you, you, don't definitely, you don't have to get fit in any particular time. Mm -hmm. You take the rate that fits for you. And the second thing is uh, something you like. Yep. Uh, you really can't do anything you don't like probably longer than three months, <laughs> even with, even with you know, yep. full force. Something you like. And the variations range from, I like taking my kids on the walk in the evening. Give you a chance to be with the family, you go around the block a couple times, you got some accountability partner there, just that. So something you like and fits in your life. And I would just add to that and echo that. Also, I think when I see patients in clinic who have undergone a big turnaround, they were completely out of shape, they got in shape, that takes at least a year so you've got to have really long-term goals. You've got to have an activity you can stick to. You've got to start doing things now in an incremental way that makes sense and stick to them for a long time. It takes a long time. The last thing I'm going to say is that, well, maybe there'll be another comment, um, is that when you do it, do it slowly. Because if you try to get in shape quickly, you will need to see us. And <laughs> that, is, that is an absolute fact. But if you just slow and steady wins, wins the race, just take it easy, do something, keep doing it. Don't overdo it. And the biggest thing, like he said earlier, is set small goals. <clears throat> the more you, the more small goals you achieve, the more excited you get because you're you're reaching different milestones. So make attainable goals. Don't set such big lofty goals. Have a big lofty goal. That's good. Have that that, that goal that you want to reach, but you need to have baby steps in order to get there. We all didn't wake up and just start running. We had to crawl first. Okay, in the front. Oh, this is Peng Xie. Uh... I have a question for Dr. Quan. Uh, yeah, I think uh, we all need to enjoy the moving first. Um, so I noticed you are an acupuncturist. So for uh, traditional Chinese medicine, they also have cupping, like Michael Phelps, and uh, Max Bastian, and you know all kinds of uh, other methods. Are you also uh, provide those or uh, giving advice or recommendation on those? Uh, so do I provide them? Or, or this, uh, yeah, the, so the clinic provides center. them. Yeah. You don't want me to provide them. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but uh, Dr. Shur uh, is our traditional Chinese medicine physician, uh, and he provides both cupping and acupuncture. And I don't know how much you guys know about traditional Chinese medicine, but it is a um, very effective way of treating many things that works on a completely different paradigm than Western medicine. When I've sat down with Dr. Schur and tried to figure out why he does this relative to my Western anatomical understanding of things, we don't connect. We, he's coming at it from a different perspective. But I do see the outcomes, and they're very good. I couldn't tell you why, <laughs> but they're, they're actually quite, it's quite powerful to see that. So yeah, so fully support that, and we have it in the clinic. Well, and actually, when you're just talking about uh, cupping, uh, the physical medicine team also uses cupping. Um, we're actually in the process of getting new cups and going through the whole thing, but it's, it's definitely available. No fire, though. We don't use fire. Yeah, we don't use no fire. <laughs> we don't do the glass cups and light, no. They, they actually have modernized it. We use silicone. Um, they suck sucking cups. They're, you pinch them, and they, um, they do the same thing. And it's interesting the way that it works because of the way that it bl draws blood to the area and the healing process that it stimulates. All right, where are we? Yes. So I hike a lot. Um, last year I hiked pretty much every week and there is to do. Um, off late I have found that my left knee and under my heel there is pain. I use braces, I use poles, I use um, um, under the heel, I use the insoles for my shoes. I have the best shoes. I did training also at uh, Building Q, but that pain seems to not go away. Is it an injury or is it just something that can go away with the conservative uh, approaches? 
The first thing I'd say, go back to what we were discussing before, is just ask yourself, does it hurt during the activity? And we probably won't want to have an open forum with specifically to do, but what I ask myself first off is when I'm hiking through that hills on different terrain, whether that be s dirt, snow, rocks, gravel, are you having that activity that is reproducing that pain while you're moving? First question. Second question, are you losing motion in your ankle? Or is that knee caving in or out because now you're compensating for that range of motion? If those answers are a simple yes, then yes, you'd want to delve deeper into getting a simple evaluation just to double check that, you, again, kinematically, each joint segment's moving well. And then structurally, there's not something in there that's torn, bruised, an overgrowth, the spur, et cetera. So a large uh, body of possibilities could be shrunk down pretty quickly if we just go back to what's specific to you and about your training patterns. So, so set up an appointment with you or the team of team at Building Q? It's certainly that? an option. Yes? That's, that's why we're here. That's why we're here. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> but it might be a little tough to get in. It's been a little busy lately, but that's what you want to do. Yes. Uh, I think we have, we have one more question. We have time for one more, and then we've got to wrap it up. Most of us, uh, we have Kaiser uh, is our medical provider, but we are not able to use uh, on-site uh, chiropractor services because we are with Kaiser. So is there any way we can get into Life, life Connections uh, chiropractic services using Kaiser? So um, we don't accept it on site. It's um, a decision that has been made. It has nothing to do with us as providers. What we generally do is um, we, are, we already have a medical doctor on site, Dr. Nelson. I don't know if you've been to see her. She's fabulous. Um, you can go to her and talk with her. Oh, she's in the back of the room, right? There she is. Um, and what I'll just answer for her, what she typically likes to do is she likes to send her patients uh, across the street here to Palmer College of Chiropractic and, and utilize those services. Uh, I was a clinical professor there for 12 years before I worked on site at Cisco. So um, your insurance works there or uh, there are other um, locations. But I would start with a discussion with, um, you know, appropriate discussion to see if that's a, a, the right thing to do for you. Okay? All right. So, everybody, thanks for making it. We uh, appreciate your attendance, and we'll probably see you next year. Like your idea, we want to make it happen. What do you need? So it is an ultra crazy race that we're taking part in. We're all in the same team here. It's completely inclusive. It's for everyone. This helps to create an emotional connection between the brand and the customer. It's very cool. <laughs> then move quickly in a controlled fashion. You ready to make some noise happen here today? Let's get it going. I think it's going to be great.